Power Popaholic, and I'm talking with Jim Bocci from Cult Stars from Mars. Um, if you don't know uh, Jim's background, he is one of um, the members of one of my favorite early 2000 bands. That is Fuzz Bubble. Had a great album. I considered that the uh, the Nirvana, the best merging of power pop and grunge ever um, at the time. Um, Jim, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Great, great. Thanks for being here, and uh, and we get to talk a little bit about uh, your background. Um, with Fuzz Bubble, I thought, like I said, it was a great, uh, it was an amazing first album uh, that came out. Um, my, my favorite song, Don't Let It Get You Down, was running through my <laughs> through my playlist at that time, like constantly for, for months. Um, but, and you worked with a lot of notary, notable people. You worked with, uh, Sean Combs, Puff Daddy. Uh, you worked with, uh, Roger Manning. You worked with Susanna Hoffs. Um, you had, I think you had it all. I don't know exactly what happened with the band or how the band kind of broke apart and what you happened since that initial success. Cause you did have a big hit with uh p diddy uh you know all about the benjamins you were the backup band for that song tell me a little bit about the the uh the history once you got w once you kind of made it and where where it all went and what you've been doing um, since before cult uh, stars okay now that's a long story <laughs> i know i know well we only have a short show but i'll do ahead. the abridged version yeah so diddy signed us it was a lot of press and a lot of talk um he's signing his first rock band he was the biggest thing in the music business at the time he was on his ascent his way up and uh you know so that was exciting for us i mean it wasn't we thought it was weird that a hip-hop label wanted to sign us but honestly like we've been through all the whole label thing and yeah. it you know everyone basically said yeah we like you but yeah we like you but and he just he heard the song so he signed us but he signed us kind of without a plan like he took his studio tech you know who was a guy who was a studio tech a long-haired like white dude and said you be the a and r department so guy who had no business really being an a and r guy was our a and r guy and we had you know management that the guy was really in the business of managing his own career not ours I so see just a, a bunch of bad circumstances. It took us like two over two years after being signed to make our record almost, wow. uh, you know, maybe a year and a half. It took a long time till we finally got to make our record. And, you know, we made it with Mike Clink who did, you know, Guns N' Roses and worked with UFO and right. everybody in the eighties. Amazing. And Jack Joseph Puig mixed, you know, jellyfish. Yep. So we were in, you know, we, we, we had great people uh, and we made this great record. And then, that's right around the time around 99 when when diddy just started getting into trouble you know he's getting arrested he's getting this he's getting that and you know it's one thing i i, I would tell people after the whole thing was over is don't sign to a vanity label so an artist who decides they're going to have a record label it never ends up well because they can't manage their own career to begin with and then you got all these other people hanging in their belt you know waiting for them right we did a lot of waiting we did a lot of sitting around waiting oh wait next week next week next week so after all that making the record we got it mastered by george marino i mean all the big people you know we were like okay our record's done finally and he's he tells us you know you guys got to pick your first single and we're like <laughs> okay not usually what the band does but if it's up to us you know, Bliss is the ideal first song because yeah. rock radio at that time was, you know, if you look at the career of Guns N' Roses or Nirvana or anybody, you know, you come out with the Gangbusters song, get the, you get some picked up on rock radio and then by song, by single two or three, then you come out with the ballad and then the ba the record blows up, right? right. Sweet Child of Mine, you know, on and on and on, all of that. That's the way that worked. And his mindset from the hip hop thing was um, you got to come out with your hottest song first. And we had this, that song ordinary, which everyone, our a &R guy basically right. gave it to every artist to record a version of. And we're just oh, like, dude, stop it. That's our song. Stop giving it to people. Um, yeah. He was nuts. Um, so, you know, he just kept saying like, 
we picked bliss and we're like listen you know the way you do rock is you come out and you put the real rock stuff so you get rock radio credibility because right, at that right. time it was you know all nirvana and foo fighters and you know right it was, it was rock. the grunge revolution it's, right it's, it was rock it was, so it was there yeah you don't come out with your poppy ballad thing so we went back and forth with that uh even to the point of one day we were sitting in daddy's house his studio and he just showed up with j-lo when he was dating her at the time and she's right. telling us you got to come out with your hottest song first and i'm like great i'm getting career advice from j-lo like and who am i to argue because she's famous already right so right, right. Like, yeah i know but in our world the things don't work that way so anyway he eventually just kept stalling and then he got into more trouble and legal this and then he started a clothing line and an alcohol line you know right he he had artists on his label that were there before us and didn't get their release their records until after we were we dropped got dropped so <laughs> I mean, we talked this one guy, Carl Thomas, super nice guy. We became friends with him because, like, we kind of commiserated. Like, and he's right. like, man, I'm just waiting for Puff to put my record out. I'm like, us too. And, you know, we, he's a really good guy. We liked his music. He liked ours. And, uh, but, you know, that's the way Bad Boy worked. They just would get an artist and sit on them and develop them and blah, blah, blah. This, that. And, you know, we're a self contained rock band. We write our songs, we know what the record should sound like, we know the right people to use. So, and they just didn't understand any of it. The label didn't really, you know, it was a hip hop label. Right. And they didn't hire a rock department. So we had a crazy AR guy. And then they got like one promo guy to kind of work our stuff. And, you know, he kind of he kind of went in it very half baked. And instead of getting like four or five people, like, okay, let's work this rock record, you know, we did do great things. You know, the 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 all about the Benjamins, you know, thing. Um that was our AR guy's idea. And he sent that song to everybody to make their own version of it. And then he edited the two together. So we got like the first part of it is Dave Grohl's as Tommy Stinson's music right. replacements. Wow. Then the second half of the song of that remix at the end part is Dave Grohl's version. And he edited them together. And then he put Rob Zombie over it. And he just we were he had asked us to do this on a bunch of other things. We're like, we don't want to make hip hop. We just want to make our music. Let's let us do right. our record. So by that time we were tired of it, but we said, okay. He goes, okay, this is the version we like. Just sing, sing the line, play a guitar part, add some things so we can put your name on it. And we're like, okay. So that's the one that went through. It blew up and it yeah. blew up while we were in the studio doing our record. So like we were in the studio in the lounge and the, you know, the, the video came on and said, Featuring, you know, Dave Grohl, The Locks, whatever, blah, 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 Rob Zombie, and Fuzzbubble. Like, our name was on the TV every day while we are in the studio. Nice. Like, oh, my God, this is great, you know. So, and then, you know, that did great for us, uh, you know, getting the name out there. And then he got us on the Godzilla soundtrack, um, yep. that song out there. And that was a huge soundtrack, you know, not because of us, but I got a platinum record for it, you know. Um, but, and we were like, okay, like, there's your setup. You're talking about having set up a band. We got the, the video and the song on the you know, platinum soundtrack. Like Jack, right. put our record out and put us on the road for a year and you'll have a record that blows up. Just get your, you know, and so, but he didn't really know what to do with rock, you know? So at the end of the day, with all the other craziness that was going on in his life, you know, and our managers just basically like not knowing what to do um and really just more about getting himself up the ladder of the music business right, right. we finally said let's just get let, we need to get off this label so we went yeah. in and got ourselves dropped and i remember being i was making the teen machine record when that happened there was a phone call the three other guys were in new york in the office with puffy and i'm making the teen machine record in my friend's studio and they're like okay where i got the meeting so i like guys uh, I'll be outside. I'm on the phone. And uh, he's like, you know, it's not really working out, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, yeah, we, you know, we need to put our record out. And he's like, but you know, you don't want to do it. So he's like, I'm not there. Go, you know, let you guys go. You guys do what you got to do. So I took do what you got to do is, oh, well, we, you know, we tried to shop the record. Right. And by that time, stupidly, really stupidly, all the other labels who had all the work done for them. They had the soundtrack. They had the yeah, you were all set. 
everyone passed. They're like, no, we did some showcases. And you know, the, anyway, yeah, so where was I? But yeah, so, you, so nobody really wanted to sign us. It was like we were damaged goods. And it's like, you people are stupid. Like you, all this groundwork has been laid. Yeah, you, you had know, everything give, set up and nobody give the wanted band to a sign normal you. Budget for, for, you know, pick up the record, give the band a normal budget for promo, send, them, send us on the road. It would have been done, but you know, we ended up just not getting a deal. And the other three guys were already back in New York. And I'm like, you know, all right. So all right, I, just, yeah. I just took it as do what you got to do as well. I'm going to put the record out myself. And that's what I did. Great. I put the record out myself. I never asked permission. I never told anybody. Mm -hmm. I was just like, screw them. They, they wasted three years of our time. I'm just going to put the record out. Yeah. And, well, you could have had these guys manager and then you really, really would have been in trouble. I know. <laughs> um, so let's let's fast forward a bit to uh get cult stars from mars okay and how did that come about and what's going on with them because a couple singles came out i was really impressed with the lineup uh you got you know darian sanaharia from brian wilson band am i saying his name right uh mike portnoy um uh you know uh yeah. and, and uh mike de carlo i believe so it, it's you got some good players with you yeah um well we started that um when uh remember when the um licorice quartet yep. released the first single we all kind of got on the text with each other and said wow did you hear that that's really cool like we should start doing some stuff again so we kind of got that was kind of what we started and it was the pandemic so like okay we could just make these records at home in our studios you know so that's what we did and i started you know releasing singles and Jason was doing a podcast, but then he got really busy and it was like, we were, we were planning to do one song a month with a podcast. And then right. things got really big. He got really busy, got a new job. He moved to California. Uh, I have still haven't seen him yet since he's been here, but mm. he did move here. Um, and I'm, I'm just like, listen, man, if you're, if you're too busy, I'm going to, you know, do some stuff with Kevin, our old original fuzz bubble studio drummer. Right. And he's like, yeah, that's cool. You know, we'll continue doing stuff. So I got Mike to do a couple more things. And I just kind of decided that I don't want to release any more digital singles. I want to put out a legit like CD. So that's what I'm working on now. I have to, I'm just been going crazy trying to mix it. And I'm just realized that like, so, well, like any of the mixes I do. So I'm going to bring in some help. And cause we have about 10 songs. Okay. They're really, it's really good stuff. It's just that, you know, I have other projects in life and all this stuff. And I'm just, Sure. I've been trying to, you know, get the mix. I just don't feel happy with my mixes. So Who's, are you, are you doing all the engineering on your own? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, I always, that's what Fuzzbub was a studio project. Right. When I learned how to engineer and that's always what it's been, but I want my mixes to be more competitive and sound better than they do. So I'm like, man, I, I'm not at that Chris Lord algae level yet. So. Right. <laughs> And I want to get somebody who's really knows their stuff. And I, you know, I got a couple people. It's just raising the money, but we got the songs basically done. We got a good 10, 11 songs. We might, okay. we might include the blinded by the light cover. I kind of want to. I think um, that's really nice. I, I mean, I, I, really I've been cool. happy with everything you've been coming out with. Thanks, um, man. Singles. <laughs> Um, I owe every time some, something comes up, I'm like, oh, okay, let's feature that one. That's a good one. Yeah, I'll probably um, do another single before we put the CD out, you know. Um, but I do I want, I want to have an actual physical product because it's just like uh, everybody can release a record on Bandcamp. I, I want to have a right. Legit it, thing, it, you know? It's important that I know a lot of people who just want to have people to have the option. You don't even have to print thousands of CDs anymore. You can just right. A small run and get it out there yeah. um as a you know as a thing the same way with records too you know right. people are printing you know vanity records you know you know red vinyl and all that stuff and just just so you have right. it you know right for, for and because people will want it and stuff so all right i'm i'm psyched that something's that you have yeah. stuff done i can say that you know something's coming soon uh right. we just got to get a you know you just got to get some producer help um who was that producer on the on the um, in Boston? I know who <laughs> works with Corin <laughs> Ashley and uh, um, right. anyway, I'll get you that name later. But um, <laughs> since we're we both, I saw you initially uh, in a panel 
with uh, Pete Pardo from, um, you know, Sea of Tranquility. And right. you guys were talking power pop. And right. I was psyched. I was thrilled. I'm like, wow, I don't believe he brought this up. But you guys did. And I picked up the ball and I said, wow, let's let me continue this a little bit with you. Right. And um, who would you say are your, let's say, top five power pop artists? Um, well, it's pretty simple. It's Jellyfish. Red Cross, the Posies, but you know, I don't have all the, I like the, the couple of Posies records that I love. I really love. I don't have them all, but you know, Frosting on the Beater. Yep. Classic. Um, and th that's in terms of the, you know, what I could consider the newer, which is the nineties stuff, but jellyfish is, you know, and I love, I love Sloan. Um, and if you're talking about the older stuff, I, <clears throat> I love bad finger. I love the flame. <clears throat> I don't know if the Beatles count as power pop. They're like the blueprint for everything. So. Yeah, they, they're more of an, I consider them more of an influencer of power mm -hmm. pop. You know, they they influence, just like the Beach Boys. Beach Boys right. are not a power pop band, but they have definitely influenced the right. sound of power pop over the yeah. years. Um, yeah. I so definitely stuff, have to agree with you. Yeah, the stuff I liked was like, uh, when I was like in fuzz bubble and I was really zeroing in on a lot of power pop and really paying attention to, what was going on there was you know jellyfish red cross the posies the muffs um uh sloan i like sloan a lot and then there were a whole bunch of other bands like the caulfields you remember them and yep, uh yep. who who's uh owsley all stuff like that you know there's a lot of cool bands in the 90s and then bands i knew from la like uh, silver jet who were amazing oh yes uh, silver jet great band my friend luke uh, summer camp another great band these are bands we would all play shows with there was a ton because when i moved to la in 1995 right the power pop scene here was just exploding right you know bands were on the cover of bam and everything um none of them got record deals because the record labels are like we don't want to sign this um <laughs> but eventually a, i think a small power pop thing happened like fastball yep. fastball great band Fast, I mean, yeah fastball matthew I mean, sweet it, at Matthew Sweet. Yeah, yeah, I actually know the bass player from Matthew Sweet, uh, <laughs> uh, Tony. Um, and yeah, stuff like that. Some stuff got through. Matthew Sweet got through, uh, you know, Fastball got through, Fastball got Everclear, through. kind of not really, a little less power pop per se. But but what would you consider, what, what did you think about Green Day? Would you consider Green Day power pop? They're punk pop, and I'm not really a big Green Day fan. I don't okay. like the way that guy sings. All right. I, I mean, I think he evolved. I think it evolved. But, you know, he's one agreed, of the guys agreed. on my list. He yeah. started out as a punk pop band and then he merged, you know, pretty much after a uh, warning. They went mainstream. Point. It became he became mainstream power pop after that. Right. And kind of stuck with it, you know, and even right. did a solo album with that with the power pop spin as well. Right. I was also I, a big fan of Weezer. You know, yeah. the first couple of Weezer records I really liked a lot at the time and you know all of that stuff urge overkill you know yep yep and uh again and power I, I actually music. urge overkill actually has a new album coming out wow uh, really soon <laughs> i wow, interviewed cool. them actually uh you know and you're gonna see that on my um on my channel soon oh cool uh, interview with urge overkill that's coming up um yeah. my, i have to give you my list um of course i like the classics the bad finger the raspberries yeah. Um, Cheap Trick is my, I think, one of my number. I left number them two out. or number like three. Probably my number one influence for Fuzz Bubble. Right, and trick. and uh, Jellyfish, of course, number one. Like you mentioned, yeah. uh, I'm enamored with Jason Faulkner's solo work. I think his some of his solo work is on par if, or exceeding Jelly. I mean, his first album is on par with a lot of Jellyfish. Yeah, author unknown, right? Yep. Yeah, I had that, and the one a couple one or two after it yeah i like those records yeah i love I the mean, grays yeah the grays yeah grays rochambeau record, that. um yeah. you know like of course weezer uh, i think all the early weezer pinkerton um even when they sound when they really got the uh the heavier sound with pinkerton and and later on sometimes it pops up now and again um that stuff is is amazing of course sloan i agree with you that's on my list as well um yeah that's that's what i consider power pop um prime right there it's funny because if you go on those pages the power pop pages there's so much finger pointing about what is and isn't power pop i know and some people have a really narrow it's like skinny ties 
you know, Rickenbacker's jangly. And I'm just like, that's kind of pop without the power. Yeah. I like a little more yeah. balls to my power pop, you know? Yeah, that, I mean, you got to have a little, you got to, like I said, if you're mixing a power pop stew and you're just putting the Beatles in the pot, that's not enough. That's like a, right. that's like putting flour in a bowl and saying it's a cake. It's not, <laughs> you got to put... I you agree know, with you, yeah. The, the cheap trick in, you got to put the, the heavy guitars in. I mean, Pete Townsend coined the phrase, the who were not power pop, but again, they were another huge influencer of right. power pop. I right. mean, there were about six bands prior to the naming of the term that really created the genre. Right. And, and others influenced along the way. I think, um, like, as far as all the melodies and orchestration that, that goes into great power pop, ELO, contributed to that influence and you have um you know for, as far as you know the harmonies and everything you know we mentioned the beach boys but there are a lot of other harmony groups that that kind of contributed as well um you know even jan and dean you know with their simplicity of right. the way they they structured their songs really you know right. meat and potatoes easy stuff right. but that all it all gets added to it and yeah. you know you know, of course, Eric Carmen and the Raspberries as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's what we like to do. <laughs> yeah. What I love to follow and love to review here. Um, right. So, we do. You do have another single possibly coming out with Cult Stars from Mars. Yeah. And um, it, what other are you working on? Any other projects? Because I know you're producing and, and doing a lot of other things. Well, I have a couple of other. Th I have so many different things. Um, I have my lounge exotica band that I've had for the last 14 years called the Tikiaki Orchestra. And that's like, you know, I don't know if you know Martin Denny or Esquivel. Yeah, I know Esquivel. Yes, I have. It's that, have it's that early, late 50s, early 60s, basically tiki lounge music, you know, yep. vibraphone and percussion and all that. It's all instrumental. I've had that band for 14 years. You know, it's basically, wow. I started out doing it myself and then I got people and we have bands several members come and go over the years but that's a really fun uh thing and it's really successful actually i do really well nice. with that one nice have you ever tried um to bring fuzz bubble back at some point in like in the past and or you tried to bring it back and and you, it, it yeah. couldn't happen we did um well the singer lives in long island i live here right um I would say around 2008 or nine, we did a couple of things, you know, all file sharing, you know, sending the files. Right. Um, but, and you know, the, the reunion came up, uh, the, the 20 year reunion came up in um, 2016. And we, I wanted to play a reunion show and our bass player, Brett said, I can't do it. I can't do it. He was living in Portland. And uh, the closest thing we got to a reunion was uh, when we did Dragonfly part two and the song called stars from Mars, our bass player, Brett, really? all four of us are on there. And then Brett, sadly, uh, last August took his own life. Oh, So yeah, I know it was Sorry pretty, I'm still, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm super upset about it, but you know, it was good because we got to, um, because when we got cult stars back together, like, well, we have to ask Brett because it was just going to be me, Jason, right. and Mark. And we were like, we got to ask Brett, you know, just have Brett play on this first song or a couple of songs. So he came and did a great job and he was all into it. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, stuff yeah. happens and it's really sad. Um, so. Well, at least you got you got to play with him a few times before, right? And you know, I I hadn't talked to him in a while. He moved to Portland. We talked. I, I went up to see him and stuff. You know, I would go up there to play with my other band, and he would come out and we'd hang out and stuff like that. Um, but we did actually get to play together. Like he sent me his bass tracks, and I'm like, oh, it's Brett, you know, he's great. So I feel okay that we got to do that again because otherwise, if I didn't. It would be, yeah. worse, you know, um, right. I mean, me and it's funny because we, we decided to change the, the name to cult stars only because we were like, do we want to keep the name fuzz bubble? Do we want to be that? Like, Hey, our nineties band is coming back and blah, blah, blah. And, right. Right. and we, we got so tired of the affiliation with bad boy. Like 
you know, a, a couple of years, a year or two ago, there was like a talk show and the band leader, you know, Diddy was on the talk show and the band leader asked him, asked him about fuzz bubble. And he gave some like, really embarrassing answer for us. And I was like, I, I no longer want that affiliation with him. Like, well, I, I like, think let's change I think, the name. I think that was the right decision. And also the fact that you're bringing in other people to, you know, help build the sound out is great. Right. So, I mean, just, uh, just to wrap things up, um, I want to encourage you and thank you for the singles that you put out so oh, far. Thank we, you. I, we look forward to hearing the album when it's all uh, mixed and, and engineered and uh, promoting it when it's all ready and stuff. And, you know, thank you very much, Jim Bachi, for talking with me and uh, <laughs> geeking out a little bit over Power Pop here. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. Take it easy. <laughs>